Okay, I'm gonna clean job for everybody so that it's who you see. Okay. Um uh, okay. Can everyone hear me? Those who I mean if you can hear me, just wait. Yes, we can hear you, can right. see you. This is the first time I'm using a Bluetooth uh, earphone. So all the while I've been using the school one, which gives me a headache after a while because it clamps on the ear and then it squeezes my snot out. Oh, no, no, that's too much detail. Okay, um, for this evening's talk, um, I guess I'll start now. Um, it's the fourth in series for uh, this year. Um, to kick off this, um, I've titled it an Axiologist Digest. Now, the word uh, Axiologist is kind of a big word, but it's basically for a scientist who works on fish or in layman's term, a fish biologist better. So today I'm looking at, um, from Case to Torrance, uh, the description of mean fish species. Uh, the cover slide shows you actually the, uh, one of the rivers in West Kalimantan in the island of Borneo. This is at Nangapino, one of the larger towns before it peters out into little uh, long houses. This was photographed in August, 2007, low water level. If you can see the houses by the river are all on silt. There's a reason why. Because during high water or rainy season, um, the water does get right up to the veranda of the houses. Okay. So meanwhile, when water level is low, the bank is rather muddy, so the layout uh, wouldn't plank to the water. Okay. Okay, so um, I'll just give a brief introduction of myself. Uh, Curator and Collections Manager at the uh, LKC NHM since 2016. Previously, I was a lecturer um, and also a museum officer earlier in RMBR. Uh, that's the old name for LKC NHM. Um, personally, I uh, graduated with a PhD in 2003, so that's uh, math is quite lousy, 18 years ago, I guess. And um, since then, uh, since my undergrad days, I have uh, participated in uh, many freshwater surveys around mainly Southeast Asia and venturing up to maybe Taiwan and China, uh, Southern China. And I've, off late, I've been doing also uh, marine expedition. So I've been involved in local ones like CMBS, which is the Comprehensive Marine Bi Biodiversity Survey of Singapore. And last year or two years ago, I think, we did the uh, Singapore Marine Fish Exhibition as part of another project. And personally, we've done uh, marine expedition, be it coastal or dive-wise. So Vietnam, Nambas, Natuna, uh, Christmas Island, Vanuatu, and various places. And usually these are all under the auspices of the NUS or the museum. And in 2018, we did a deep sea cruise uh, uh, termed F. Jardis to the deep waters of the south coast of Java. So as an ichthyologist, um, yeah, uh, the, my career is not say very, very long. It is very short, but my production rate is not very high. Um, because part of the talk, um, you, I will tell you some of the reasons. So even then, um, I have uh, personally described or personally or co-authored uh, description of about 175 species of mainly freshwater fish. Uh, a few words of, uh, um, okay, acknowledgements. Uh, I'd like to thank JAR and the OU section for hosting this series of talks. Um, the research would not be possible if there was no funding. So most of the work that I do, uh, the funding comes from the museum and US. And for the first part of the talk, when I'm talking about the Philippine fish, it's to my co-host, my co-author. Uh, we got his funding from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources in the Philippines. And for some of the other work, uh, we've got our permits, uh, relevant permits from Sarawak Forestry Corporation and the Indonesian Research Institute. And along the way, we have collaborative efforts with uh, various universities, various laboratories, um, other museums as well, and a mountaineering club in Prosperidad in uh, Mindanao. And uh, of course, a lot of field assistance from mainly museum staff, um, 
and also DBS staff, amongst which uh, Lo Wei, uh, uh, who is now uh, doing his research fellowship in Hong Kong. I'd like to thank him as well. And part of the work that I do would not be possible if I not had uh, material from various industry players. So I just give nicknames there, the initials, but you know who you are. And I've used mainly my own photographs, but I also use other uh, photographs from other people as well. And I'd like to thank my wife for uh, tolerating my interest and in cooking my dinner just now. Okay, now the process of new species description. <clears throat> it's, <coughs> it's a very tedious um, uh, kind of affair uh, because it needs a lot of backbench work. It's not as simple as saying, oh, that's a new, new species, let's uh, name it. Yeah, it's easy to say that, but it comes with a lot of work. Uh, this particular chart here shows you on the left side, it basically shows you the process if you follow it through. But the process is not so simple. Um, it used to be simple in the earlier days, in the 90s, early 2000s. But of late, um, getting the research permit, getting the export permit, getting the collection permit require quite a bit of time, sometimes up to a year or more. And some people's experience, it never came. So you have to abandon that part. And uh, authorships, I put the co open bracket, earth, close bracket, authorship. Most of the times, if you have your own way, a co-author who actually has uh, um, aided you, but sometimes it's co because you have no choice. He's the boss of the person you're working with and without the boss approving the work, you can't get it done. It's a very real fact of life. Okay. And uh, how fast a paper is produced, there's also a lot of it is dependent on the reviews. A lot of the, International peer-reviewed journals, they require two sets of reviews, preferably unbiased. But then again, you know, uh, reviewership is voluntary and sometimes biased. So you, you, you sometimes have to choose. And for that, uh, the, for this talk, uh, the basis of it is on two papers. I'd like to thank Kevin Conway, who's based in Texas. He managed to pull through pretty well. And of course, the onus is up to the author or the co-authors. Um, the editing, the revision, and then finally the proof stage. Now, both papers that I'm going to discuss about in this talk are from Raffles Bulletin of Zoology. And the good thing is, uh, for scientists and people who want to submit the papers, it's free. And if you go into the journal itself, it's free to download as well. So that's uh, something that the museum has done very well. Okay. And uh, of late, also sometimes you have a new species, everything is smooth. You still got to wait if uh, the governmental or the overseeing authority once can will approve the name or not. So uh, as again I mentioned, it's based on two recent papers, um, both published in September just uh, last month. Uh, one is on a cave uh, barb found in Mindanao Island in Philippines. And the other one uh, is a continuation of basically what I did in my uh, PhD work. Okay, and uh, both, uh, um, I would say is relatively fast paced. The cave bug was uh, uh, specimens that were collected in 2014. So if you count it that way, it took about seven years for it to be published. And for the other one, um, a bit longer, uh, because it was literally based on fresh material since 2006. So that's like 15 years. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's, so it's on slow brew all the time. So for the first one in the Philippines, now the island of Mindanao, I think is the largest island uh, in the archipelago of Philippines. And Mindanao is, I would say, poorly explored except for certain parts like Lake Nanao here, which is very well known for this endemic uh, species of uh, uh, cuprinus. And then you have 
okay, the area that we're looking at is near Pros Prosperidad. This area, apparently there's a lot of the limestone in the area. Okay, as I mentioned, primary freshwater fish in Philippines is poorly known. Now, what do I mean by primary freshwater fish? Unalt freshwater fish, freshwater? No. So, um, for scientists and biologists, uh, when we call something a primary and a secondary, there are differences. So, a primary freshwater fish is basically a fish that evolved totally in freshwater. So, things like cyprinid barb, loaches, uh, catfishes. Whereas, for instance, secondary freshwater fish would be fishes like gobies, which originate from the sea and then invade or migrate into freshwater. That's what we mean. So many of these species that were earlier described from Philippines are poorly illustrated. I mean, so when you describe it, the standards then were not so good. So they were either without figures or without photographs. And what made things worse? Some of the earlier work, uh, the type material, which is, which the scientists use it to base to describe the species, were lost or destroyed during World War II when the Japanese bombed Manila. And since then, um, to, to my knowledge, there's no uh, fresh collection or properly curated collection. So the island of Mindanao in the Philippines has the highest diversity of primary freshwater fish, especially from Lake Lanao. Okay. Uh, rest of the riverine habitats are poorly known, and even less is known of the cave fauna. So I introduce you my uh, co-author, uh, Dr. Daniel Edison Susana. So he's actually a carcinologist. I mean, he actually works on crabs, but he specifically works on crabs found in caves. So along the way, uh, that's him in the field, uh, yeah, with a caving helmet and looking a bit deceivable because caves, I've been to into some of them, that we really then they're not the most comfortable of places to go to. It can sometimes be very, very humid or very warm. And yeah, and you, you have to be comfortable working in the dark. So this is one of the cave systems that he collects his fish from. This is a particularly interesting one because there's a lot of fresh water. And in places where there is a lot of fresh water, one very huge danger or problem is flash floods. Because in limestone caves, the fresh water is permeated from the surface. And sometimes it can be upriver, I don't know, 100 kilometers, there's a heavy storm, that it could be flooding in the cave, but you won't know because you're in a, a different area. So you have to be very careful. So um, the water in the cave, not necessarily shallow. Um, there are even places where you can go spelunking, cave diving. So yeah. But in this case, the water is not murky, as you can see. So it's uh, on a good day. And in the shallows, okay, that's, that's uh, Daniel himself, or on that. And they spotted some pale looking fish. Okay, but before that, he actually found two species of cave, blind cave fishes from this series of caves. And this was described earlier in 2018 because uh, Helen Larson uh, is the main author. She's the world authority on gobies. And the moment she saw the gobies, she said, oh, that's new. Because there's only one other known species from Mindanao. So um, it's very interesting. Yes. There's no pigment, totally devoid of pigment. No eyes. And these are two main features of fishes that are fully adapted to caves. And just to let you know, in Southeast Asia, Sundaland, there have been several uh, cave dwellings described, but this is the first one, Babodis microps, okay, described in 1868 by Gunther. And the population actually comprised of ice and island individuals. And it seems there's no pigment as well. Uh, of late, I've not been able to, to, to get more information on this. Um, well, uh, but currently I'm working on it and uh, not working on the fish, but working with the Indonesian colleague to try to get fresh material. So this is Babudis pyrofolios, okay, uh, photographed by Ed. The fish was actually curious enough and hungry enough to start pecking at his legs uh, when he took the photograph. 
Okay, this is a, a young individual. And this is a freshly caught one, a uh, larger one. As you can see, their eyes, uh, the, the body looks pink because there's hardly any pigment, but the fins have a bit of orange. So what this means is that it is not uh, very highly adapted to cave dwelling yet. And it's not truly lost all colors. Eye is still present, but whether is it functional? I'm not sure. Okay. How you test functionality of, of the eye is when you shine a torch on a fish, that does the fish uh, 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 give a reaction to it. Okay. Personally, I've only collected cave fish once or twice. And for fully adapted cave dwelling fish, if you shine a light on it, it's not affected. But if there's water movement, or when you touch the surface of water, the fish reacts to it. That's, that's the difference. Okay, so that's the probably the holotype. When, I, when Ed first showed me this photograph, I said, oh, that looks like goldfish. I didn't think too much of it. Then slowly as you look at it, oh yeah, it's different, huh? it's not a goldfish. You, and and, and, and uh, this is the preserved specimen, this is the x-ray of the fish. So um, something odd about this fish is that the, the head seems to be larger and the eyes are a bit irregular in shape as I'll show uh, further photographs. So there were some abnormalities observed in the type series. Uh, larger mouth and misshapen eye, probably also partly due to uh, inbreeding. You can imagine in a cave system, uh, how many of these fish are around. And um, yeah, there, there probably isn't that many, probably maximally in the hundred. Okay, so this one has larger eyes. Okay, look at that, it's like almost bulging up. So I suspect there's been a, quite a bit of uh, inbreeding that leads to the poor genetics of cave fishes. These are two other individuals. As you can see, if, if it's a real, really, really true, uh, uh, very long evolved cave dwelling fish, the eyes will be absent and there won't be pigment. So you wouldn't be, shouldn't be able to see a spot there. And then the edge of the fin, you shouldn't be able to see gray as well. Pigments will be lost. And outside the cave, there's actually a nice stream system, uh, water that's coming out from the cave. And, oh, you get similar looking fish, but with color, with spot, with functional eye. And which we later keyed out to be a relative, relatively poorly known fish as well, Barbodes Montanoi, which was named after a French traveler uh, collector, but, uh, by the cinema by the Montanoi. And that's the x-ray of the fish as well. So during the process of the description of the fish, um, because the, the, the fish in Mindana was uh, poorly documented, the comparative studies could not be really carried out. So that's one of the complications that I faced. But without using Mindana material, I actually compared it with the other Barbode species that's found in the streams and rivers of Mindana. And um, there was a slight delay. Okay. And just a side note that Lake Nanao itself is well known for its endemic species, uh, species flock of granite barbs, with, of which there are 13 endemic species, but only three to four persist to this. Okay. So this is some of the lookalike from other parts of South, uh, Southeast Asia. So this is known from Borneo. Barbode cilii, okay. uh, very similar looking with spots on the body, but there are differences, head shape. Even the spot itself is more elongate rather than tall. Okay. And one feature is the serration on the, do uh, the dorsal spine, which was absent, absent in Montanoi and the uh, cave species. And there's Barbodes banksi, Barbodes barnotatus. So you can see even within Southeast Asia, there's quite a bit of difference. And some of these are include the juvenile, so that to show that there's a ontogenic change. In the young, there's many, many spots, and in the adult stage, there's less. So you can imagine if, let's say, uh, a scientist comes along and only has one specimen of the, or very few specimens of the adult, and someone else comes along and only catches juveniles, they might think they have two different species. So in today's context, 
you should have a good theory and then you can compare. And if you have collected them yourself, that makes the story stronger. Okay, and Barbodish don't cry. Uh, that's the adult, that's the juvenile, the rather pretty one. Barbodish Avreti. So for the longest time, Dunkarai was, uh, I think, synonymized with Avreti, but they are very different animals or fishes altogether. But at the juvenile stage, they look fairly similar. And yes, so this is the Lake Lanao's uh, interesting species flock. Um, these are pictures that I managed to photograph in uh, the Natural History Museum in London when I was there in 2009. Uh, some of the material they have, these are not type material, just uh, voucher specimens. And yeah, very interesting. When uh, I mean, the main author for these uh, species is Harry. This American was based in the uh, Philippines in the 30s, 40s. Uh, unfortunately, most of his material uh, were destroyed in World War II. So he did name some of them like Pontius Tras, Pontius Manalok, Amaras, Spratilis Cypress, Palata, Pontius Lanawensis, Pontius Windock, Pontius Serang, Pontius uh, Baulan. So some of these names are actually the local names for the fish. But of course, now the, the, the genus Pontius is actually. Uh, they changed to Babu, this an older available name. But many of these fish now, I think, are, I would say, locally extinct until um, someone else goes and have a look at this place. But Lake Nanao is um, a difficult place to assess because of its uh, political situation with a Muslim separatist. So that ends the Philippine section. Uh, next section is actually the continuation of uh, the Borneo sucker story. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, based on fresh specimens accumulated and collected since 2006 and finally published. So in Borneo, uh, in the hill streams, there's a lot of uh, uh, riparian habitat like this. And this, these are called riffle. It's caused by a sudden drop of elevation in the streamline. And it's usually the base is rocks. So to get over the rocks, uh, this is low water level. So that's why the locals, the Iban, have to push the boat up. So, so where are the researchers? Well, we are on the bank. We have to walk over the rocks. Yeah. So this was a photograph in Sarawak in 2018. Okay. Um, it's surrounded by unlocked forests. So it's very, very pristine. And the locals, they're, they're, they live downstream and it's so clean for them that they just drink water straight from the stream. You see them, they don't bring water bottles. Right? Uh, where do you get your drinking water from? They, oh, just drink from the stream. Like, oh, okay, a bit of culture shock. So um, the basic information on Indian freshwater fish of Borneo is pretty well studied. Okay, um, the fast flowing water habitat, relatively less surveyed. Um, back in 2006, uh, this is based on my PhD thesis. It was published as a book. And I revised uh, gastromyzon along with new gastromyzon, and I mentioned hypergastromyzon. At that time, there were two species known. And I speculated that they, are not, they don't belong in the same genus because of some morphological differences. But I had no fresh material to back up my claims. So now, 15 years later, with fresh material, a much clearer perspective is achieved. And in the process, I managed to split them up. And then in the process as well, two other new species are described. So this is a timeline of the events. Uh, for those who are sticklers for timelines and details, you know, not, not, not very precise, but this basically tells you the, the, the event. So hypergastromyzon was described by Roberts, a prominent American archaeologist, okay, based on a single specimen. Uh, no, sorry, based on this single species, that we had like three or four specimens. And they were collected in 1976, but only described in 89. So taxonomy is not a far sign. And he described another species of the same genus, hypergastromyzon eubrancus, in 1991 based on specimens collected in 1982, which were left like sort of uh, undiscovered in a sense. Okay, and then subsequently, fresh material were obtained 
but um, not very well preserved. Uh, no color notes. So in 2006, uh, back then I was a P oops, I was a PhD student, and I, I decided to cover this as part of my uh, thesis as well. And I thought they they don't look the same, so that's all I could say. Okay, and then between 2006 and 2011, I actually managed to obtain from the ornamental fish trade more hypogastromizone, which was then uh, I thought it was very, very rare, but actually it's not. And it actually was a contaminant because the main target was gastromizone. Then in 2007, I had the opportunity to go uh, quite far inland from uh, SS to West Kalimantan into Central Kalimantan at the headwaters, and I managed to find more hypogastromizone, two species in fact of uh, hypogastromizone. And then 2018, yes, this is the one, the present, just uh, three years ago, under the auspices of the Sarawak Forestry Corporation, I could sample, resample the Lupa Basin here and got fresh material. And this is 2021. This year. So that was the team that uh, uh, went in in 2018 to Sagara. This is Yongkir, Ifa, uh, that's myself, looking a bit. Uh, oh, that, that stick there that I'm holding on to my shoulder is electrofishing rod. And this is Speedway, and this is Zaki. So Zaki actually has a, a GoPro strap on his chest. So, and uh, this was the fish team. So not, not everyone was here uh, because I think Ifa and Songket, they were looking for snails. And amongst the, we had a team of four other locals and they were instrumental to helping and bringing us from point to point, making sure that we are safe and lending a helping hand. So this is what the habitat looks like, the mainstream. Uh, very fast flowing water. This is considered low water or uh, on the low side uh, because when it rains heavily, there will flash flood and then the water can rise up to two meters more and milky water. Okay. And the rocks are all looking rather rounded because of the rushing water and erosion. So this is a traditional way of push netting, okay? Uh, where you work in teams of two, one person will agitate rocks facing upstream of the person holding the net. So it's a, it's a back breaking job, job. And because of uh, push netting, I think I've injured my back over the years. And all this effort, we've got two gastromites on. Uh, well, in the earlier days, this is considered, well, it's good. Okay. Now, new uh, new tool that we've been using, electro uh, fish, uh, electro fishing. So that's uh, Ifa taking a video of what's happening. Uh, this is Kenny with a backpack uh, electro fishing. So initially we were using gloves and we realized uh, actually it was very cumbersome. And so basically it works that there is a, uh, I think this is the A note, and then the cathode is dangling behind him. So only fishes in close vic uh, vicinity is affected. So some of the habitats are beautiful. Okay, it's pristine rainforest. Um, now on, uh, after almost two years of lockdown, this looks really, really nice. But to get in there, yeah, it takes two days. So this is a short video clip I have of what happens during electrofishing in a small eddy. Okay. Yeah. So that's Kenny probing. And uh, there's some people there downstream hoping to catch the stunfish. Look carefully at this side. Ah, there you go. You saw something silver? Ah. Okay, so they actually managed to catch it. Okay. So the it pays to be alert. So this is what we caught. A rather big fish, a bit too big for my bottles. So after photography, we revived it and we released it. It's a Hampala by Makilata. Beautiful uh, grown specimen. Yeah, actually the locals said, hey, fresh fish, eat la, eat la. I said, no, 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 we don't need this one, too big. So 
So along with it, uh, sometimes we get, uh, okay, this is a gastromyzon. This is one of the targets, hypergastromyzon ubrancus, which is now known as Encaria uh, ubrancus, and a new gastromyzon. Yes, this is the office. So after every site that we collect, I would find a spot to sit down and then write my notes. Uh, this is a particularly nice spot uh, where there's a, a chair level kind of flat surface. Uh, in the field, it's so hard to find a stable flat surface. Okay. And yeah, uh, so that's, that's me doing my notes. And yeah, pardon the bad handwriting. I think I can read it, but I'm not sure about the rest. So this is the place that we went to on certain days. And then uh, uh, it's not, it's just, it's two views, but in the same book. So basically there's a running code, the date, and then the, a brief name of the place, description, uh, GPS, the altitude, the rough, this a very, very basic description of the place, the habitat. And then I'll have a species list. Uh, you can see annotations and things like that. Because I do take tissue samples, I take photographs, etc. Okay. Um, my specialty is fish, so I can ID them down to species level. But I do recognize some tadpoles, shrimp, crab, you know, snail, insect, and insect. Yeah. So usually after each field site, uh, this is actually taken in another place, uh, also in Sarawak by 2019. I'll do a bit of field sorting. But sometimes uh, it's good to go through them just to see what you missed out on your species list, or to separate out, let's say there's a gravel, there's stone that's mixed inside the bottle. Uh, it's not good because uh, it would erode the specimen. And also uh, we expected to do an, uh, an estimate of the number of specimens that we have to pick out from our export permit. So this is another place again, uh, with larger fish from another site. And plenty of water to look through our preserve collection and sorting now basically counting as well. And also to process them a bit more, injection of formalin, and sometimes to even take photographs, the fresh color before it fades. So this, um, it was described by Roberts in 1991 as hypergastromyzon ubrancus. And now it's a monotypic genus. That means uh, only this group of fish is, uh, only has one species, Encaria ubrancus. And it was only known from the Inkari uh, River Basin, Central Sarawak. So I named the genus after the basin name. And interestingly, there is a difference in both males and females, uh, secondary sexual characters. Males have uh, very pronounced uh, tubercle ridges on the opercle, pronounced if you have a microscope. But if you don't have a microscope, um, yeah, I, I didn't notice it when, when, when I was in the field. So this is a female one. So uh, I managed to obtain quite a large series. The reason being every site, we only got maybe 10 or 20 max, but we hit several sites. And I'm not sure in the field whether I'm dealing with one species or not. So we can only discern that uh, once you're back in the lab. Okay, uh, and apparently during this uh, collection uh, session, no juveniles were collected. So apparently um, in the original type series, Roberts did mention about the difference in coloration. So this is actually the picture of the preserved specimen, uh, juvenile, but I didn't get any of this. So I, I, I couldn't add on to this. So what's the main difference between Encaria and hypergastromyzone? Well, hypergastromyzone has fully fused pelvic fin. So this is Encaria. So you can see the, the base is fused, but the distal part or the ending part is not fused. And that's the anus, by the way. And the area here is scale. That means it actually has scale. Where for hypergastromyzone, it's naked. That means no scale. Okay. Uh, the other characters, I will come to it, uh, I'll come to it later. So for hypergastromyzone, it's complete fusion of the pelvic fin. Um, the reason why these sucker loaches have fusion of fins and very big fins is because they use the whole area as a sucker to stick onto the rock. So they are, they are fully adapted to living in very fast-flowing water. So this is the female. 
um, this is the composite of the dorsal view, lateral view, and ventral view. Um, you see some markings here that's actually caused by abrasion uh, from handling and not that it's uh, part of the feature. Okay, so it's a very um, flattened, I would say dorsal, dorsal ventrally flattened fish. So it's like a sucker. So this is the, what uh, the, the differences in the male uh, in Korea. Uh, here it's not so obvious, but the next few slides I'll show. So the front few rays of the pectoral fin is, it looks very thick or like yellowish thick skin, but it's actually comprised of multitude of uh, tubercles. And whereas the male along the opercle, there's many, many like white lines. These are actually comprised of individual rows or larger tubercles. So there you go. Up to 33 to 50, uh, I think 50 tubercles are possible. So there are individual tubercles like this, and then there's the tubercle ridge, a feature for male uh, in Korea. And that's the densely packed tubercle. So this is hypergastromizon, totally different in terms of tubercle arrangement. So for the male, uh, the pectoral fin is just a single row of large tubercles, no densely packed one. And then along the operculum is just single uh, large tubercles. So again, no uh, tubercle ridges. So these are some of the differences. And then with x-ray, um, I'm, I don't really read fish bones that well, but something stood out. If you look at the anal fin, the first pterygophore, which is the base of the bone that's embedded in the, in the muscle, this is soft, whereas this is simple. So that's a telltale sign that something is different, something is going on. If you uh, access the journal and look at the paper, there's there are actually more details. So that's the artificial key that made up uh, to key out the three species is known now of hypergastromyzon. So hypergastromyzon sambas is the one that uh, is known from the sambas basin, and this is the one that we encountered in the ornamental fish trade. Cumulus, the original one described by Roberts from Papua. And then another new one, Abditus from central Kalimantan. So cumulus. So this is a uh, relatively fresh material collected by Morris in uh, early 80 okay. or 90. And then this is fresh color of cumulus. Okay, very cryptic golden brown. Mm -hmm. Uh, cryptic coloration. And this is the habitat, the actual habitat that I managed to snorkel and catch uh, gastromyzon humidity. And very strange habitat indeed. Uh, it's a nice, very nice stream. On one bank, you see vegetation, nice forest. And then on the other side of the bank, which I didn't show here, is actually a grass field. It's, the, it's, it's the, the Kampong's football field. So this river demarcates the edge of the national park. And along with uh, hypergastromyzon humilis, it's one of the rare ones as well, gastromyzon ridden. Again, this is uh, one of the few times that it's been illustrated in fresh colors. Uh, unfortunately, downstream of where these fishes are found in Sumer Malawi uh, of the Kapoas Basin, there is illegal gold mining. So basically they're pumping out gravel from the bottom of the river and going through this series of uh, seas. And then subsequently using mercury to amalgate with the gold dust that comes out of it. And of course, logging activities. Next is uh, hypergastromyzon abdita, okay, described from central Kalamata in the upper Kratingan basin. This was obtained uh, from a single field trip uh, to Bukit Raya, Bukit Baka National Park. Fresh color. And that's the habitat that we actually got them from. We actually snorkeled and managed to catch a few specimens here. Water was rather cold and someone was in the shade, it's like a, a good eight to 10 degrees cooler than outside in the sun. And along with it, um, interestingly, I've, okay, uh, I've, I've, I've not managed to key this out yet and I'm not sure what it is. And because I only have very few specimens. And the last one is hypergastromyzon samba, okay, from samba's uh, basin. 
And uh, material is only known uh, purely from ornamental fish trade as a contaminant. High coloration. Yeah, from the aquarium trade. It was mixed with uh, gastromyzone stellata, zebrinus, and tinocastellus. Okay, and this is this basically shows you the dist distribution of uh, hypergastromyzone uh, in Korea. So this is the political boundary of Sarawak, Brunei, Sabah, and the largest chunk uh, belonging to Indonesia, the Kalimantan region of Borneo. So in summary, a uh, new species description takes time, and it is definitely faster if you're familiar with the group or if material is available. Okay. And there's much work to get specimens, the comparative material, and you need to have a good grasp of the taxon group. And there are many more specimens sitting on the shelves awaiting discovery. Okay, so this is, um, I think, taken by, uh, we see taken by Kenny, Xiongkiat, Ifa, myself, and two uh, local Iban helpers. This is a rather murky part of the downstream of the uh, jump. Okay, I can take questions, but would you all like to see a few more bonus slides? I don't think you have a choice. I'll just keep on going. <laughs> so you may ask, um, I mean, some of these further slides may, may, may answer some questions. Um, what do we do when we get all these specimens? Well, uh, what happens is, once you reach back Singapore, you take them out of formalin, you sit them in uh, tap water for leaching. And this goes on for about three, four days. And meanwhile, doing that, I will sort them out and then I also will photograph uh, specimens. So it's a rather lengthy process. And with sites with many, many specimens like these, it might take up to a week or more. Process. Okay, and this is the setup that I use to photograph uh, uh, preserved fish. Uh, but this is a total different series. Another work can be just made fully on scientific photography of aquatic specimens, which I have done on various occasions. And oops, okay, this just tells me that what follows stuff is um, mainly candid show. <laughs> so in the field trip to Sarawak, there's a lot of logistics involved including buying food to feed up to, I don't know, 10 to 15 people each time for about up to 10 days. So that's the bill from one supermarket. And yeah, the, the final figure can be like a thousand plus ringgit, but it's necessary. Then uh, it's very Spartan kind of uh, conditions. Um, here I'm cooking, I don't know, cooking instant noodles. And I came up with my own recipe for corned beef pasta bolognese. Apparently a hit with the locals and the team members. You can ask them. Now, or, and sometimes you have few lunches. So you just steam rice and they, whatever they can get. So it's fish usually cooked in bamboo or just grilled over the open fire. And for condiments, very interestingly, lime, salt, MSG. Go figure. And I got to sometimes eat my test subject, my favorite uh, Borneo suckers, deep fried, quite crunchy. And uh, this was the 2019 team, very well organized. Yeah, like almost like synchronized electrofish. <laughs> yes. Um, some of the habitats we go to are very pristine and very interesting, uh, aquatic macrophytes. Um, yes, some people might say, oh, why don't you collect some of this to grow in a trade? Oh, look, we didn't have permits to collect plants, so we just took photographs. So this is an endemic species of Cryptocarini, found only in that region, Cryptocarini auriculata, and lots of uh, Bucephalandra, kind of a riparian uh, aeroid growing on rocks in fast flowing water. And yes, sometimes we have round table few discussions like this, there's no table, so we just use the net. So we are discussing with the locals, like, oh yeah, what's the name of this fish, or working out the bills, things like that. And a bit of a, a field photography, you just make do. 
Okay, I have uh, placed a flash on top of uh, some tidbit. Oh yes, uh, this is our sleeping pill. Uh, flash, uh, dead leaf. And what, what was I photographing? This. Also described this year, a new species of uh, semi-terrestrial crab found, in, found living in tree holes. Arachnocalfusa rimba, described by Prof. Peter Ng. So um, the photographs were used in the actual description. A very long-legged purplish crab that crawls around the trees going up in the tree holes. So the, the, the few specimens that we managed to get were the low tree holes. I'm sure there, there are more further up, but we just couldn't see them. Yeah, this was another um, crab that we found on perch on leaves of the Josusama Satiba. Uh, very pretty. Yep. That's it. So um, I'm open to questions. Okay, thanks, Yok. Uh, I've Welcome. accumulated some questions that have yes. been put into the chat box. So I'll read out. There's quite a lot of them, so we'll try to answer as much as we can. Oh, okay. So um, do the great relation of color, eye functionality of the same species of river and cave fish show the same DNA? Are these changes due to mutations or epigenetic changes? Okay, this, this I can't answer because I don't have the, the, the molecular data for that. Um, the co-author actually has the material. I think he's working on it separately or as a separate project. So that you just have to wait for it. But from what I understand is that um, what people recognize as species, it's all relative. It's at which point of time we are talking about. How far removed are they? How much, how many percent they are different? Or I mean, in this case, lack of pigments with pigments is a very good uh, character. Yeah, I think the next question is a bit similar. Um, how much morphological change or genetic change do you need to see in a fish to be considered a new species? Oh, uh, well, I've come across cases where an additional black spot can mean a different species. But you must be confident or you must have seen enough specimens Okay. Um, sometimes, usually it's, no, it's not based on a single character. It's based on a combination of characters, both descriptive and something that is tangible, that, like number of fin ray counts, number of scale counts, etc. And also keeping in mind that molecular data is not the, it's not the magic bullet, it's just one of the many characters. Yes. Two people have asked you this question. What inspires you to study about fish and not other stuff? Oh, good question. I never really asked myself that, but I, since young, I was interested in fish. And I guess I never, never uh, really looked back. In that sense. And then um, it, it also helped that uh, at my time, um, yeah, at my time, 1995, when I qualified for honours, there was still a department of botany and a department of zoology. And I had classmates who qualified for both uh, botany and zoology honors. So they had a tough, tough choice to make. But I only qualified for honors for zoology. So there's only one, one pathway in that sense. So yeah, I went with that. Okay. So have there been records of invasives establishing themselves in such habitats? So I, I assume it's ah, the habitats that you've shown. Yeah, okay, in the, in the very pristine habitat, no, we, we have not come across uh, any invasive or non-native species. But one very telltale sign, um, because we, we normally start the trip from a small town and then take the long boat to probably the last long house. We stay overnight and then we go further in. So we actually see the transition of the vegetation, the river type. I mean, it's from a large meandering river to a clear water, rocky, rocky bottom uh, stream. And we do realize as well, the amount of man-made waste gets less and less. Because the area experiences flooding. So the debris that's stuck on the uh, the branches of the, the bank-like trees 
it's a apparent sign of where the, the highest water level is. And if you're near the town, the long houses, you see a lot of plastic bags, clothing, ropes, things like that. But once you get into a more and more pristine forest, just branches, leaves, you know, things like that. So it, it, it does make a lot of difference. And the water gets a lot clearer to the point that the locals start drinking straight from the stream. Mm. Very pristine. Okay, so have you ever been infected by a parasite while collecting samples out in the field before? Mm. Yes, but that can be a different story. <laughs> actually, actually, Partly, um, it's because usually most of the time it's either through food or uh, stupidly sometimes you go swimming and you swallow some water, but you don't know whether there's an upstream that's a bit because the water looks clear. Yeah, that, that does happen. Okay. Are uh, the tubercles on the opercle distinct enough to be detected with fingers or fingertips? Oh, I, I, I didn't try rubbing it against my finger. I didn't use the needles because it, it was only observable uh, through a microscope so it, it's not very apparent when i get a fresh pattern so if we illustrate that let me go back a few slides um, but if you use a fine tip needle you can actually feel the the raspiness so like these for instance then if i show the entire body uh, so this is the female with the male, you, you can barely see the, the, the tubercles, just very thin white line. Mm -hmm. So in, in the field, I didn't notice this at all until I was back in the lab and I look, was looking at the specimens under a microscope and I realized, hey, how come it's got this tubercles all over the tubercle? Yeah, oh, this one is a presentation question. Do all fish have to be preserved in formalin long term, or is ethanol possible? And have you ever suffered any short term or long term effects from handling formalin pres preserved specimens over the years? Oh, okay. Um, that's that, that's quite a few questions. Yeah. Um, for soft bodied animals, the standard protocol is to use formalin to fix it, um, because formalin breaks the sulfur bonds in protein and that makes the, the body rigid okay. and if you were to purely put the specimen in ethanol which we, which we do for extraction of dna you are not preserving the fish you are just dehydrating the fish so there's a difference in that okay and in long term uh the specimen that is placed in full ethanol that the the, the specimen actually gets bleached faster and becomes very brittle Whereas the one in previously treated with formalin actually retains uh, its shape and pattern much better. And as for short-term effects with handling with uh, formalin stuff, uh, we try to use gloves, but sometimes it's not possible. Uh, that's why we have copious amount of fresh water to flush it away. Even then, um, the skin on your fingers will get affected. You get flaking skin for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay. Do you think there are other Ankaria species from Central, West, or East Kalimantan? Good question. If you fund me to go there, I'll try to look for it. But, <laughs> but looking, you... looking at the... Okay, sometimes fishes like this, if you look at the overall, um, overall distribution, it actually gives you a clue to what's happening. So if I go to the map... It actually shows you the biogeographic distribution. So it seems like hypergastromyzon is concentrated here. But I do know that there are specimens collected from here. But in Korea, so far only here. So I'm not sure what's happening there. But maybe there's some in the adjacent drainages. It's possible. Um, is it easy to determine the conservation status of these new species as they may be understudied previously or they are rare to find yeah. in nature? So for very rarely obtained species like this, the conservation status, one of the criteria is the area of distribution. So if you know and you've only collected it from one spot, then it does have a profound effect on the determination of the uh, 
conservation status. And most of these um, succulosias that I've been working on, they are, I would, I, would, I would almost call them point endemic, because they're, they're not very found in very big areas. At most, it's a, 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 a tributary of the main river. And the next tributary order also may have them. But without ground truthing, it's, it's not possible to, to answer that. Mm. Okay, that's a fun one. What do the mm. fried suckers taste like? Uh, Ikan bilis. I mean, it's just fried fish. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, I think we have just time for one more because it's almost nine. Uh, why is gastromyzon uh, only found in Borneo? Uh, very interesting question. And there's one I can't answer you. Because, uh, I mean, it's just biogeography. Mm. By the way, the, the first gastromyzon was uh, described by Gunther again in 1868, based on specimens collected in Sabah. And that is gastromyzon volume two, which is I think somewhere around here. And in that first series, there were several specimens. And then again, it was Robert who found it, uh, who actually re-looked at the type series and discovered there were two species in that series uh, Gunther described as gastromyzon bonensis. Out of the four, only I think one was bonensis. The other three, and uh, Robert described as methylogaster. So, um, as to why they're only found on this island, I have no idea. Animals are strange. Biogeography, I guess. Mm, partly. To that extent, I always wondered. Because the island of Palawan, if you look up the north part of uh, Borneo, that little thin island there, uh, it's always considered part of Sunda shell. Uh, but it's not well explored. So there may be possibility there are other interesting freshwater fish on there. Because right at the tip, you know, uh, uh, the northern part of Borneo is called the, the dog head. So this is now the jaw and the ear. So between the years, there's a drainage system, there are gastromyzons there. Okay, it's already nine o'clock, so we'll have to stop with the questions, unfortunately. Oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so before everyone runs off, uh, we'll just quickly change our slides and would greatly appreciate if you could fill in a feedback form for us as usual. Uh, and yeah, if you would like to support our research and education efforts and you'd like to donate us a gift, uh, you can scan the QR code. And um, you can also have the link to the feedback form, which is in the chat box. So if you just spend a couple of minutes to fill that up, we'll be really grateful for that. And um, yeah, so as you guys trickle out, if anybody wants to unmute and ask Kyok any questions, you can do so because yeah. he'll still be around. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, someone raised a question, raised a hand. Um, I, I don't know how to get to that. I don't know, how, but. See, now you want to ask a question? You can unmute yeah. yourself and just when ask. You, when you um catch the fish, then do yes. you like release them back? To the waters that you catch them from? Sometimes I do that. Uh, if provided I have already uh, have enough specimens of it. If not, I will keep for time. Meaning I will have to actually kill the fish. Hello? Oh. Oh no, she got frightened away by the answer. <laughs> no, oh, she's accepted that. the answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm looking through the chat box actually. Um, yeah, most of the questions have been answered. Oh, someone said surprising the notes don't have water stains or wrinkles. Oh yeah, I dry my hands before I write. And um, those are normal paper, but of late, I've got a series of uh, waterproof notebooks 
But the problem with waterproof notebooks is Ew. when the paper gets wet, it sticks to each Thanks. other and it becomes very uh, not easy to turn the pages. Mm. Okay, ask for Did you? Oh, yeah. So, by the way, that's my knee. Oh, so cute. Animals. A any fish? Has any fish that you thought has been extinct? Mm. I'm okay, maybe, but I, I'm not sure at the moment whether it's still found in the wild because some of the fishes that I first worked on one are not from the hill streams but from peat swamps, uh, like fighting fishes, parasromers, things like that. Uh, these habitats are in peril because most of the peat swamps have been converted to oil palm plantation or has become uh, res uh, residential areas, I mean, like houses. Mm. What did you say? See, yeah, maybe. See, okay, good. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Here's one last question uh, from yes, sure. Sun Kyung Wee. Yes. Would genomics, uh, you want to ask yourself, Sun Kyung? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I just wondering because yeah. uh, in microbiology, uh, we often yeah. use like genomics as the final like confirmation for taxonomy. So I was just wondering whether uh, for fishes, uh, is, the, is that genomics as well? Is it more like uh, morphology? No, okay. The, 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 how should I put it? Genomics only works if you have a reference library. That means you, you can refer to something standard. Then you can key out what you have with that particular species. Do you agree to that, sir? Yeah, correct. I understand. Correct, right? Because if you don't have a reference, you, you don't know what you're looking at. So the most common genomic library that you refer to currently is GeneBank. But GeneBank has a lot of inherent issues because there is no owners on the person inputting the data, nor is there any responsibility of the so-called website, the, the, the facility holder, GinBank, to double check what you put in is the correct uh, species. And many a time that we found out a lot of molecular biologists, once they extract a the tissue, they actually throw away the body, which is actually your evidence because you have to verify it. You might think it's the same species, but taxonomists might come along and say, oh, actually you're looking at its sister species, something else. So it's, it's all the, um, according to interpretation. So in that sense, I would say the gene is one method, but it's not the method. So ultimately you still need to refer to something else to, um, to verify. So if like your question was a hybrid cross species, yes, if you have both parents that say available in the reference library and you do the genomics for the purported hybrid, yes, you, you can possibly uh, confirm that it's hybrid. Okay. Otherwise, Thank you. Yeah, okay. But otherwise, what I'll do is I'll look at morphology, like color pattern, uh, things like that. Usually the hybrid, uh, would be a chimera of the parental species. So this this has been uh, alluded and sometimes, I mean, you, you can't get confirmation of it because sometimes only, you only have a photograph. It's very common in marine fishes, actually in reef fishes, where the two ocean currents meet at a certain point and you get hybrids there. And you can only speculate, oh, because of this photograph, it seems to have uh, characters like bars of this species, but it has a, a color pattern of the other species. Therefore, it's a possible hybrid. So not unless you can get the bodies and then do the necessary. Yeah, yeah. right, cool. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. I think that's pretty much it. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Welcome. We shall end this in a little bit. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks for attending. Thanks. Thank you. See you here. See Bye. You.
Thank you. Bye. Bye.